Hello. Welcome, everyone. And thank you for joining us this evening for Citizen Book Club Presents with Dan Pfeiffer. Uh, yes. Um, tonight, we'll be talking about his book, Battling the Big Lie, How Fox, Facebook, and MAGA Are Destroying America. Um, I am Ralph with the Philadelphia Citizen. If you have not heard of us before, we are a nonprofit media organization that focuses on solutions, journalism, and giving citizens the tools they need for civic engagement uh, to reignite citizenship in Philadelphia, where democracy was born. Um, we also have him tonight with uh, Lauren Make from NBC10. And I wanted to... I want to do a notable thank you to NBC10 for being a partner this evening. Um, I also would like to thank our other partners, Head House Books. They are out front. If you would like a copy of the book after the event, feel free to grab that. It is for sale, and Dan will be out front um, to talk, to sign, everything else. Uh, also, thank you to our venue partners, Fittler Club. If you've never been here before, it's a beautiful space. If you're interested in touring, uh, you can find me outside of the ballroom doors after the event, and I'll be happy to connect you with a member services associate that can give you a tour. Um, tonight with Dan, Dan is number one New York Times bestselling author, co-host of Pod Save America, one of Barack Obama's longest serving advisors and White House Director of Communication under Obama from 2009 to 2013. Um, before I kick it over to Lauren, I do have to do some same shameless self-promotion for The Citizen. We have a couple of events coming up. Um, one on July 15th at... Hello. At 10.30 a.m. We'll be kicking off a mural tribute project with Mural Arts Philadelphia and Penn Carey Law School to honor the late Judge A. Leon Higginbotham, a Philly civil rights uh, pioneer. There will be food, music, and afterward, a, self, uh, a guided tour by Mural Arts of the Social Justice Mural Corridor. Um, then on August 15th, we have a rescheduled event uh, with MSNBC host Ali Velshi, who will be talking about his time reporting from the Ukraine and the role of democracy and protect the role of media in protecting democracy today. So thank you all so much for being here again, and I'll kick it to Lauren. Hello. Oh, that's so much better. Testing. Perfect. All right. Okay. All right. We'll use the backup mics. Um, well, thank you guys for being here. Thanks, Dan, for taking the time. Um, and, I, you know, I didn't initially realize that you were a local guy. I am. Born and raised in Wilmington, Delaware. <laughs> I do a lot of traveling, and Delaware normally does not get that round of applause, so this is very cool. <laughs> and uh, you know, Delaware does get, you know, a little bit, of a, little bit more of attention these days than it probably got before growing up. Yes, I would like to thank Joe Biden for bringing attention to something other than our tolls. Anything we're known for? <laughs> but you never worked for Joe Biden. I just, I just learned that as well. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say this was a particularly important position, but I was an intern okay. for one semester mm -hmm. in Joe Biden's office in college. So a lot of people look back at that point and say that's where the path to the White House began. So, Is that still on the resume? Absolutely. Okay. It, Honestly, it fell off for a few years. It's now near the top. <laughs> um, well, we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about your book, um, and we're going to take some questions from all of you. I feel like this mic is going in and out. Now. Going in and out. Hmm. One two one two one two one two one two. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. I can talk really loud if necessary. Uh, we'll talk about your book. We're going to get some questions from you guys. Um, but there's also been a lot going on recently. So I want to pick your brain a little bit on some of the things that um, we have all seen happening recently um, in the country, and that um, the first one is the Supreme Court, Supreme Court decision uh, regarding Roe versus Wade. So let me just first start out and sort of get your reaction to that and your thoughts on how this is now going to play out. Sure. I mean, we have known in some way, shape, or form this outcome was likely from the moment Amy Coney Barrett took Ruth Bader Ginsburg's seat, and then we've known in an unprecedented amount of detail of what that it would happen based on the leak of the draft opinion a month ago. 
But even knowing it was coming doesn't take away the shock and anger that comes from it. And I think it's important just to kind of lay out what it means and what the context is. And so one way to think about this is you have a Supreme Court majority. Five of the justices on this opinion were appointed by presidents who received fewer votes than their opponent. They were all confirmed by a Senate that represents a minority of the American population. And for the first time in American history, took away a constitutional right. One, the, in, the, in, the, in the opinion, Alito has a bunch of footnotes where he talks about precedents. It's not a, you know, there are times in which the court takes, uh, un, you know, will revisit longstanding precedent. But in most of his examples, he's referring to times in which you reversed the decision for the purpose of expanding who got to participate in our democracy. And so for the first time, we're actually, there were millions of people who woke up on Friday morning who had a right to make a decision about their own body who did not have it by that afternoon. That's a pretty shocking thing that has not happened in our history. And so obviously this is gonna play out politically in a lot of ways we can talk about. It. It's gonna play out differently in various states, but the question is where is this going? We don't really have to guess about that because Justice Thomas told us what he wants to do. He wants to use this decision in the Dobbs case to revisit all of the rights and decisions that were undergirded by the same principle of a right to privacy that is, it first began in the Griswold v. Connecticut case. So he very explicitly, he, he delineates them. Uh, access to contraception, uh, gay marriage, uh, the you know state laws regulating sexual conduct by individuals, private sexual conduct by people in there, every single part of a, like I view this decision as the beginning of a right-wing assault on personal freedom that is going, that is largely unprecedented in modern American history and we should be very clear about where this is going. We are, have obviously seen um, people reacting to this protest outside Supreme Court. There was a very large protest um, outside City Hall in Philadelphia, um, as there were in many other cities. Um, and you know, sometimes when we see big events like this and we see people react and we see people come out and protest, it dies down after a while um, as other things happen in people's lives, they get busy. And then there are other ones that sort of build from it. And I wonder what you think about this one because we are going to be seeing the impact in different states continue to come out over time. Do you see this as one that may fade by November in terms of the motivation for voters? Or do you think that because we're going to see laws coming, news coming, you know, week after week after week in different states, that it's something that's going to build? I think that the, the question of the political impact of this decision, which is, it really boils down to, you know, for a lot of Democrats, is this going to be something that is going to motivate people to engage with politics at the level in which Democrats need to upend the historical trends of what is often a tough election year? And the question is, we don't know, but it's a question that every person has the ability to influence. Like, it, it is very possible. I mean, people are, attention span as a nation is getting shorter by the second. But there will, as you point out, there is going to be aggressive implementation of these laws, prosecutions of people. I mean, there is a story, um, it's on the Daily and then the 19th News today about people who were sitting in the waiting room at abortion clinics when the decision came down and were not able to get their procedure. They were, as soon as the decision came down, they close the doors, turn off the lights, and send those people home. And so there are going to be stories like that all across the country. And, the, and ultimately, if Democrats want to make sure that people are thinking about this, when it comes time to decide, are you going to volunteer, are you going to vote, are you going to engage, we have to be the ones to talk about it. We have to raise it up, because it's not going to, on its own, stay in the top of the news or stay at the top of mind, because there's so much happening in the world. So we have to make it, Democrats have to make a decision as a party to drive this message home, to keep it from being another sort of outrage that fades into the distance, or is it gonna be a rallying cry for how we fight back for the future? Uh, as I'm sure that you heard, there was also discussion in the last couple of days about um, codifying Roe into law um, and 
how to do that and whether Democrats would be able to do that and whether they should have done it before. You worked in the Obama administration at a time when Democrats did have a majority. Was that something that you look back on now and think there should have been more emphasis on that in an attempt to do that? I went, this has been something that's come up, is why, you know, Democrats have last had unified government for two years in 2000, and from 2010 to 2000, 2009 to 2011. So why didn't we codify Roe? And I, and if you go back and look at, and you don't take my word, you can take the word of NARAL, the lead, one of the leading uh, pro-choice groups, is, because President Obama ran promising to, if he, that if he could, he would sign a law codifying Roe. He did not do that. Why did he not do it? Because there were not 50 votes in the Senate. There was a th more than a third of the Democratic House back in those days was uh, anti-choice. It was a very different period. The, like, obviously, every one of us looks back and say, could we have done more at any point in our careers to have averted this outcome? Like, what is the thing that could have prevented it? And I'm confident that there's lots of things that politicians I've worked for, myself and I could have done differently, but I do believe that codifying Roe was a mathematical impossibility in that 2009, 2000 period. The party has just changed dramatically. To give you a sense of what, how conservative the Democratic caucus was is that Joe Manchin would be like, kind of towards the middle, in the 2009, 2010 Democratic Party. Do you look at that now, though, for any lessons that you think President Biden and Democrats should be considering now? Because, you know, there's, there's a debate within the Democratic Party about how much to push now and whether to do more compromise bills or whether to push through everything that Democrats want to get through. Sure, so I think there's a couple of lessons we can take from this, is that one, when Republican Supreme Court nominees say that they think Roe is precedent, we should not believe them. And we should never, we should, I think, frankly, assume the worst. That there is no, like it seemed, if, like three weeks ago, it would have seemed insane that a Supreme Court would revisit the less the seven-year-old decision to say that marriage equality is a right to revisit that at a time in which 70 percent of Americans and huge majorities of Republicans believe in the idea of marriage equality. So, like, why would they do that? Well, clearly they may, they may do it because they overturn Roe despite 75 percent of Americans not wanting them to do it. So, one is just we have to prepare for the worst and think about it. And like, we should make progress wherever we can. And like Joe Biden has two problems when it comes to codifying Roe right now. One is Joe Manchin, because Joe Manchin does not support, he's, the, he's one of two Democratic senators who have, have not endorsed the bill to codify Roe. The other one uh, is Bob Casey, who I think he eventually said he would support. Um, he has said. Yeah, he, yeah, he, he came around and said he would support it. Um, and the other problem is also Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema because you need to get rid of the filibuster. So a lot of people, most notably, I think, John Fetterman, who is running for Senate here, said, send me to the Senate, get us 52 Senate Democrats, we will eliminate the filibuster and we will codify Roe and do a whole bunch of other things. And I think that's one thing we should be, Democrats should be very clear about. And we as voters should ask our politicians, are you committing that if we elect you and we get 52 Democratic senators, you will do, you will eliminate the filibuster and you will do it to codify Roe? Now, that doesn't mean that we've solved all the problems. The Supreme Court could take that down as well, but that is one for, like, because people want to know what can be done. This is one thing, and we should do everything we can to do it, and we should be super explicit about it. Um, all right, so let's move into um, to some other things. We may circle back to some of that stuff. Um, oh, somebody is very popular. I think that's Bob Casey, since he... I, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, you're, you talk in the book about working for Tom Daschle. Was that your first big campaign? It was my third big campaign. So what was, was your first big campaign? Uh, President Al Gore's election. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tell me how things have changed 
since then? Sure. So I, I use an example in the book, and I think about the media world of the year 2000. And the, nothing, writing this made me feel old. Telling this to you people out loud makes me feel even older. But it's just, it was a very different world. We used to fax press releases. <laughs> For those younger people, fax is a technology where you take a piece of paper. But... Um, that when I would travel for work, I would just not answer emails for seven days, and I would return, and then they would just all be there, and people were totally okay with that. It was very, it was like, work, electronic correspondence operated sort of like, uh, you know, letters from the Civil War. <laughs> like, it just, um, but the one thing that was very different, beyond the technology about this, is so I'm working for Al Gore, our headquarters is in Nashville, at the end of every day on that campaign, the communications and messaging political staff would gather in a room, and we would have three TVs, and we would watch the evening news from ABC, NBC, CBS. And we would make a decision, sort of an assessment of how we had done that day based on what that news said. Was it, good, what, did we get coverage? Was that coverage good for us? Was it our chosen message of the day? You know, if we decided we want this to be about our healthcare plan, do they actually talk about our healthcare plan? And at the exact same time, in Austin, Texas, the Bush campaign would get together and do, have the exact same exercise and make a similar set of judgments. We were operating in a shared reality of sorts. Like, we obviously had huge disagreements, uh, but we were, we were living in the same world, we were communicating with our voters through the same mediums. And you think about that, like that exercise would never happen today, right? The way in which people consume information has changed so dramatically and primarily on the right, where the overwhelming majority of conservative voters in this country would never watch ABC, NBC, CBS. They would make all of their assessments from something existing within the right-wing media bubble, whether that is Talk Radio, Fox News, Breitbart, Ben Shapiro, those sorts of things. And now the campaigns are having two different conversations through two different mediums, through two different set of voters, and that has dramatically changed both how we campaign but also how we govern. Uh, you talk in the book about um, a right-wing echo chamber and the need for a progressive echo chamber. I have some questions about that. I imagine, yes. <laughs> Um, first of all, do you work, well, first of all, explain what you mean by that, and then I'll ask you. Sure. When I, the, I use, I use, echo chamber is a, is one way for it. The term I use is, I like to use is megaphone, which is, there is a massive apparatus on the right that is telling their story to their voters on their terms. If Donald Trump, as president or candidate, wants to say something to his voters, he has a mechanism to do that on his terms with that message delivered by people who share his political interests. On, for better, we can talk about the value of this for democracy in a second, but from a pure political efficacy standpoint, here's how Democrats tend to communicate their message. A bunch of really smart people, they get in a room, they get polling data, they wordsmith it, they figure out the exact right thing to say that would persuade your target voter here in Pennsylvania. And then we take that perfectly tuned piece of persuasion and we hand it to CNN. We say, CNN, we know you don't care whether we get elected or not, nor should you. We know that you have a set of interests that are different than ours. Could you deliver this message on our behalf to our target voters? Oh, and by the way, our voters have less trust in you than at any point in modern history. And that doesn't seem like a good way to do business. Like, if you were running a pizza delivery business, like, you wouldn't hand it to someone who did not work for your company and be like, deliver this, right? And so, what, like, my, my argument here is that we, and I talk about this in much greater detail in the book, it's not that we need to engage in the same tactics as the right, which is disinformation, conspiracy theories, a lot of outrage bait that generates traffic on Facebook, it's that Democrats need a way to communicate with their voters on their terms. And I argue that we can do that from a position of truthfulness, factual information, um, because I 
believe we can because I think that's what we do at Crooked Media and Pod Save America. But until we, like our message is currently getting drowned out by this right wing media machine or MAGA megaphone as I like to call it. And so if we want people, people need to hear, if we want to ha persuade people to support us, we need, they need to hear our message and they are currently not doing that. Do you worry though that ultimately by what you're suggesting, you could just be pushing people farther into their separate silos and that that is ultimately not good for America? I mean, I worry about everything, just as a general rule. <laughs> so yeah, uh, but I, so I'd say a couple things about that. One, the right wing, and I sort of detail, run through this in some de detail in the book, had a two-part strategy for how they built their megaphone. Part one was to spend years, decades, convincing Republican voters that they could not trust the media. And so it was liberal bias, liberal bias, don't trust them. And then, then part two was to create a alternative ecosystem for them to go to and live in entirely, right? So to hermetically seal it. And when you, like Pew Research does this study every year of, it's called the State and Media Study, and they look at people's media consumption habits about, you know, where do they get their information? And Republicans has been the same for about 10 years now. It is almost entirely right-wing content. Fox, Rush Limbaugh when he was alive, Drudge Report, you know, all, all right-wing media. And li self-identified liberals, like the most politically active Democrats get their information from a, primarily mainstream media sources. Some, might, some progressive media, certainly, but largely local news, ABC, NBC, et cetera. And so I don't wanna create a hermetically sealed liberal bubble. Like, I don't think that would be good for us. I actually don't think it would be successful because there's no appetite or interest either among Democratic politicians or our voters to be told to tune out or ignore traditional sources of news. And so I don't want to do that. I simply want to build up the progressive end of it. I want to skip ahead to part two of the Roger Ailes, Rupert Murdoch plan and just build up our, you know, our messaging entities without trying to say, you cannot believe a single thing the New York Times says. Do not trust the New York Times. If the New York Times tells you the grass is green and the sky is blue, the opposite case. That's not, I don't think that would work. I don't think it's good for democracy and I don't think it's good for Democrats because we have a different political task than Republicans. Yeah. And you've, you've played different roles in, um, you've had different roles, not just played them, you've had different roles um, over the years working in government, working in campaigns. And so I wonder how do you sort of balance those different things with what you're talking about? Because when I was reading that part of the book, one of the things that I thought about was a conversation I had recently with a Republican state lawmaker here um, about guns and gun laws in Pennsylvania. And I was asking, um, and he was supportive of um, certain um, new gun laws, specifically red flag laws. Um, and I was asking, you know, why, why is it so difficult in Harrisburg to get something done? Um, and he said, well, you know, it's about getting people to listen to each other and understand different parts of the state and different communities and that life is different in different places and really to listen to each other. So how do you sort of balance what you're saying, which may be good for politics and getting Democrats elected with what might be good for governing, which are bipartisan bills potentially? Yeah, I mean, ironically enough, as we have been engaged in this very, very um, period of a of aggressive polarization, you know, you have half of Republicans in the House voted against certifying Joe Biden's election hours after a mob of Trump supporters almost murdered them, yet admits that, right? And we should expect that if the Republicans take the House, they will impeach Joe Biden in the first six months to a year that, that they have control. They've actually passed a bunch of bipartisan bills this year, like kind of a shocking number. Now, none of them are the sorts of things that end up on the, the monument, right? It's not, but they are like actual governing, thing, important governing stuff. Like I think one of the things that we have to do, it, like my take on American politics right now, is that America is actually getting 
more united in the population as a whole. There is a growing progressive, pro-truth, pro-democracy, pro-science coalition in this country. It, the, the numbers have grown over time. The problem we currently have is that we have an extremist, radical minority that has been willing to and engage in political violence to hold on to power. And we have to defeat that minority. And if we're ever going to have a world in which Liz Cheney and Mitt Romney can be Republicans, it's gonna require defeating that radical right-wing faction in this country. And we've always, we've always had this, you know, the John Birch Society, et cetera, over the course of our history. But what now, because of two things, one is a very like unique time in demographic change of this country where that faction is dramatically overrepresented in the Senate and the Electoral College. Just by the, like, populations are shifting, people are aging, people are aging into the electorate at this exact moment in time that we have gone from a place in 2012 where that minority was over, that majority was probably overrepresented in the Electoral College to 2016, 2020 where it is underrepresented. And then you have social media which is mobilizing and radicalizing this faction at scale all across the country at hyperspeed. And so we actually, we have, if we want to get back to actual functioning government and government, we could actually do things like take on climate change or handle a pandemic like the modern developed country we claim to think we are, we're going to have to fight back against the, the forces of disinformation and division. Do you think that we should keep the Electoral College? Absolutely not. I mean, it's wondering. I mean, it's like such a freebie because it's basically impossible to get rid of, but it's a terrible idea. Um, you brought up January 6th, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about um, talking about that. And let's start with the, the hearings, um, which we have seen uh, five, I think. Yeah, point. that sounds right. Um, and there's another one tomorrow. Another one, a surprise hearing happening tomorrow. Um, were they what you anticipated? They are much better than I feared. I think they have done a tremendous job in communicating. Political communication requires two things. It requires getting people's attention and then telling them what they, what they need to hear. And so the first part is very hard. And they have, the committee has absolutely grabbed the nation's attention in a way that's nearly impossible. So 20 million people watched that first hearing. That is six million more people than watch game six of the NBA Finals. I mean, if you can get six million more people to watch a congressional hearing than Steph Curry, like that seems like success, right? And look, I mean, it's hard to get people to, like ratings have gone down because of people have more choices now. 20 million people is a fraction of the 168 or so million people who voted in the election. It's a fraction of the 100 million people that watched O.J. Simpson's Bronco Chase live on television in 1994 which is the most amazing fact I discovered in the research of this book. Um, so that's one, I and mean, they've got the nation's attention. And they have very cleverly, and I think smartly, understood who their audience is, and they understand that uh, Adam Schiff or Benny Thompson or any of these Democratic members of Congress telling people that the election was not stolen, that Donald Trump knew X, Y, or Z, or any of that, is not gonna persuade a lot of their target audience. So that's why they view so much Liz Cheney, using a Republican, the daughter of the essentially Democratic Darth Vader for years, uh, <laughs> to tell that story. And even more importantly, because it, it's very easy, like, I mean, she's obviously not a Republican in good standing right now, but, then they to you, constantly use the videotape footage of card-carrying members of the MAGA movement to make the case against Trump. So they've been very successful. And so, but it's not just television ratings. The, you know, I, every day I get an email, because I am a huge loser, that has the top 10 Facebook posts with the most engagement, because I want to kind of know what's happening in this toxic cesspool that 70% of Americans participate in. And, <laughs> It is truly the most depressing email I get every day. It's like Ben Shapiro, Dan Bongino, Ben Shapiro again. And every once in a while, like NPR will sneak in somehow to the top 10. Or there's like, a, like a, 
one of those sites that's just like cute dog pictures. And sometimes I'll just go like check to make sure that like cutedoggies.com is not like some white supremacist recruitment site. <laughs> but in the 24 to 48 hours after the hearing, that list was dominated by progressive pages talking about 1-6. So to the extent that they're grabbing my, they're grabbing the conversation, I think they're delivering the messaging in an effective way. And in Trump's first impeachment, support for Trump went up and support for impeachment went down as the hearings went on. So far, and it's still early, support for the question of whether Trump should be legally charged with a crime for January 6th has gone up since it started. And there was even a poll in New Hampshire last week where Trump was now losing to Ron DeSantis in a Republican primary. Now, no one should write home <laughs> and be like, great job, people. We've traded one authoritarian for another, but it is a sign that people are paying attention and hearing uh, information about Trump that is influencing their decisions in some way, shape, or form. Is there, is there someone that you think, if they had that person testify, that that would make a difference and get the attention of people who are not currently listening? Donald Trump? Mike Pence? I mean, if you had someone testify, as effective as these video uh, clips are, if you had someone testifying in a powerful way, sitting at the dais, like, I mean, the testimony from the Justice Department officials who were recounting the story of the insane attempt to put a mid-level environmental lawyer in charge of the Department of Justice so he could say the election was corrupt. But if you had someone in that format, that would be very cool. I think it is probably Pence. I mean, the Trump thing would certainly be entertaining, although I don't know what we would necessarily get from that. Um, yeah, probably, I think probably Mike Pence. What are you watching to see how, see, see how deep the impact is, is going to be? I mean, one of the things I'm watching is just how Republicans talk about it and whether that changes, whether their tone changes, whether it's sort of less, you know, potentially less um, an aggressive defense and more just sort of a we'll see. What are you watching? I think I t when... Whenever I look at something like this, sorry, from the perspective of like a political operative, is you want to find like one poll, poll number and measure its change over time to see if it's working, right? And so, because you need to find some measurable way to do it, because the, 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 the measure of success for these hearings can't be, did Merrick Garland charge him with a crime? Because that's, the committee is not Merrick Garland, right? He's going to make that decision on his own. Or did it save democracy? That's the question I get all the time. I was like, is this, is this gonna save democracy? I was like, well, we're putting a lot of weight on a congressional hearing, if a congressional hearing is gonna save democracy. So I wanna look at two questions, which is, one is the one about whether, about Trump's culpability for what happened, and the second, which has been going up thus far, and the second is a measure of Democrats' engagement in this election. Because my belief is, and this, the committee's job is not to win the election for Democrats, but ultimately they are trying to sound the alarm about an ongoing existential threat to democracy in this country. And that, I think, that will theoretically translate into greater engagement from the broader public that helped, they got involved in the process after Donald Trump won. And some of those people have, tu have tuned out, they've stepped away. Can we bring that back? You know, because ultimately, for Democrats to win the Senate and all the important governance races, they actually just have to turn out the people who voted for Joe Biden. You don't have to persuade a single MAGA voter. We, the election is taking place in these states. They're at least narrowly have proven themselves in the last two years to be blue states that support Democrats. We have circled back to the midterms. Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, you you were uh, working for President Obama during the, the shellacking year. Yeah. Um, that was not of the talking points, thank you. Uh, what are you expecting? Oh man, that's a tough one. Um, like look, I think it is important, and I really wrestle with how to talk to people about this, because I think it is incredibly important that Democratic leaders, people who have platforms, people who host podcasts, for whatever that's worth, are sort of honest with people about what the challenges are. Because I think the worst thing we can do as a party is just say, like, it's going to be fine. Just give us your $7, 
17 times a day and we'll be fine. Like, I think, because I think we, like, we have to play the long game here, right? Like, this election is going to happen and we're going to have to get up the next day and we're going to have to figure out how to stop Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis from taking over the White House and what is potentially a violent insurrection to upend the will of the people. And if we break faith with people by being dishonest about the challenges, then that's going to be much harder to do. So this is my, my most honest, realistic, kind of optimistic take for you. So I think we have to be very clear. The House is going to be very hard to hold. It's not impossible to hold. It's absolutely not impossible to hold. The, the House map right now is, le is less tilted against Democrats than it was at any point in history. There, when this is all said and done, there will be potentially just about or, if, or a couple more districts that Joe Biden won than in 2020. So that, that's, that's progress. The Senate and the governorships are taking place entirely in states that Joe Biden won, right? Most notably, Pennsylvania right here. And we have, there is, the, as I said, this growing majority. And so we absolutely have what it takes to win the election. We are going to get some very serious headwinds, right? The, um, if you were to take a political science 101 class and people were to tell you what the current political environment was in this country, and they asked you to make a prediction, and you were to say the Democrats were, were going to expand your Senate majority, you would probably not get an A on that. But it doesn't mean it's not possible. And we're in the middle of it, like we're, this is all operating on the shifting sands of time, right? Like what was true about politics on Friday morning at 7 a.m. is not true now, right? There's gonna be more of these hearings that are sort of grabbing the country by the lapels and trying to focus them on it. We have more, like there are Doug Mastrianos running all across this country doing crazy things. Donald Trump is going to be out there. And so like we, there are opportunities to upend the historical trends for a president's midterm and do better than people think, but it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take a lot of engagement. Before we move on to questions, I want to look sort of beyond the midterms also, um, because especially now after... Friday's Supreme Court decision, we could see a lot more focus on not just state races, but even beyond that, going into state House races, state Senate races. And for a number of years now, so much has seemed sort of nationalized. Um, and it's been about what's happening in Washington and that sort of message, you know, that that's what people pay attention to do, in addition to the fact that um, you have a lot of people who grew up with cable television. You have a lot of people who, um, you know, sort of grew up with the internet and sort of all of that. We can all see the same thing at the same time. When you think about, and if I had a Republican here, I'd be asking them the same yeah. question, but from the Democratic Party side, are you prepared to do more of those super hyper local races that may be coming up and may ultimately determine what the policy on abortion is, what the policy on, you know, guns is. Is the Democratic Party prepared for that? We have to be. There's no question about it. I mean, but are I they now? It is a, f I think that, yeah, I think the answer to that is yes. There has been, the Republicans have been well ahead of the Democrats over decades in terms of investing Mo real money into state ra state legislative races, for, you know, school board races, recruiting candidates, training them to get someone to go from school board to mayor to state legislator to senator to put in place a policy apparatus at the state and local level. Like we have this Roe v. Wade decision because Republicans invested money and elected a lot of far right candidates and state legislatures who wanted to try to take down Roe. It happened because Republicans won state legislatures in red states. And who is affected by this ruling is going to be determined by what happens in these state legislature, legislative races and, and gubernatorial races. Like take, you know, I use the example of the state of Michigan, where, which Michigan has a trigger law on the books. And so it, you know, they passed a long time ago. Roe v. Wade is overturned. There will be a process to uh, make abortion illegal. The Democratic attorney general named Dana Nessel is running for re-election. She has said that, because it's a very poorly written law, that if she is a reelected attorney general, she will not enforce that ban in Michigan. The Republican is going to enforce it. So it makes a huge difference. Now, since 2000 and, 
uh, 16, Democrats have invested a historic amount in state legislative races. There's a group called Run for Something, which is one of my favorite groups, which is recruiting candidates all over the country. They are recruiting candidates to run for everything from state senate to state legislature to county auditor, because county auditors are the ones who count the votes in some states. And Republicans are absolutely doing that. Steve Bannon is on his podcast every week trying to recruit people to, in his terms, seize the, apparat the electoral apparatus in this country so they can determine who when, who gets the White House, regardless of what the people to say? It's not good. I can see the look on your face, yes. And so I think Democrats are investing. We absolutely have to do more. We have to, uh, like, it, it has to be, it can't be a boomer bust thing where it's like Trump wins, so we get really engaged in this. We, this has to be like we're doing 2022 and 2024 and 2026 and on and on and on because that is where political, that's, we have to build bottom up progressive power in this country. We want to fight back against what's happening. All right, I think it's time to take some questions. Uh, how are we doing this? Are we, do we have a mic for them? We... Okay, we'll start right here. Check, check. We got one right in the front. She was real quick with that, so. <laughs> hey, just make sure to say your name. Hi, my name is Cheryl Darby. Um, I have a question. There was an article t that came out today that one million people have unregistered from the Democratic Party, registered to the, to the Republican Party. Now, it did, I know there's nuance, and you know, I did say that some of them did that so they could vote in a primary against their can, whatever. But it said, this, we need to pay attention to this. And it, it interviewed some of the people and said, you know, it was the COVID restrictions, it was the constant talk about racial injustice, it was, and some of these were lifelong Democrats. So it, it's, I read it this afternoon and I went, oh God, like, it's just, what do we do? I mean, I think this, this, this you know what? We're so bad at messaging. And I think this is a byproduct of we're so bad at messaging. And I know that it's, you talk about it in the book, but what, I mean, what, what do we do? <laughs> okay, right. so let me give this a little context. And I'm not, try, I'm not gonna try to sugarcoat it. I promise you that. Um, so there, a story came out that said a million people have switched their party registration. And as the questioner pointed out, some of those people are like, the people, Democrats in Wyoming, who are re-registering to vote for Liz Cheney. And some are re-registering in some red states to vote against the most MAGA of candidates. But I think that is not the majority of people are talking about. After every presidential election, there is sort of a re-sorting of like people who were registered as Democrats. Like, a lot of these people are Trump, Democrats who voted for, you know, people who voted for Obama in 2012, Trump 16, Trump 20, and now, they have just, they've aligned their registration with their vote. But, like, I think we have to be aware of a couple of things. Like, and when you read the article, and it's obviously, they've, it's not a statistically significant sample. They're talking to some random people. They're, in some cases, perhaps maybe even picking out some of the most noteworthy quotes. Um, but, like, the, the takeaway from that is Republicans have successfully branded Democrats in a way that... It, is hurting us. And that sort of gets to sort of the whole point of the book is I think we are suffering under the weight of this nonstop right wing noise that is pushing an anti democratic message. Um, and like what we're, there are, the numbers are not the same, but there is a, on the other side, an equal, not equal in size number, but significant shift of people. 600,000, right? So we're looking at a difference of 400,000, which is a lot of people in a, in a in general, in the country, but there is a, you also had a similar shift on the other side. But I think it speaks, like, put aside the registration numbers because I think that complicates the bigger picture. What we ought to look at is the Virginia elections where the main reason that Glenn Youngkin beat Terry McAuliffe in that state was Terry McAuliffe's fundraising emails. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Anyone who got those knows why he lost. No, um, the... The reason he lost was the Republicans turned out at a much, Terry McAuliffe actually got a lot more votes than Ralph Northam got in 2017, but the, the Republican turnout was up way higher. But there was in some swing counties a snapback of people who had moved into our column because of Trump, 
who went back for Glenn Youngkin. And that's what we really have to watch because the math for Democrats is so hard, despite our growing majority, that we have to turn out all of our voters and hold on to some of those suburban voters who voted for Mitt Romney against Barack Obama but have come to our side, Liz Cheney Democrats, if you will, and we have to keep them, right? So that is, like, that is a big task for this election. Let's take one on this side. Thank you. So um, my name is Vidya. I'm a big fan of the pod, so it's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> um, so one thing that you said that stuck with me uh, was your comment that right now you feel like the, the pendulum has sort of been left and right, and now a majority of Americans agree on a lot of things. Uh, whether that be reproductive rights or sensible gun laws, that there's a majority in the middle that's sort of like pissed off at sort of both sides. It's like, why can't we just agree about the, the shit that we agree on, frankly? And um, my question is, if, if that is true, and it is also true that there's a tremendous amount of polarization, right, where it's... Um, you know, we had some very uncomfortable Thanksgiving conversations in my family, that type, but where people who are normally reasonable are sort of, have gone insane, MAGA insane. Um, if that is also true, is it better to frame midterms and topics and agenda items, not Republican Democrat, but as just sort of human common sense. And, and I, I guess my, my question is, it, are we disadvantaged framing things as Democrats are pro-women's rights, even though that that is true, or that Republicans are anti-women's rights, even though that may be true, instead of making it a Republican Democrat, just say, if you are for women's rights, then you, then yes, John Fetterman. If you are for uh, reasonable gun control, then you're for. Do you know yeah, what I'm trying I, to say? I do, I do, and I. So I agree with you. I think, I think that one thing that Democrats should do is frame our agenda in the context of the broad bipartisan majority that supports it. And that, so there is a common sense bipartisan majority that includes X, Y, and Z that supports common sense gun safety measures, that women's right to choose, marriage equality, $15 minimum wage, do all of those things. And I think when we talk about Republicans, we should talk about Republican elected officials or congressional Republicans and not anyone who is registered as a Republican. And I think that sometimes we delve into that and we get our anger goes to the people who support the Republicans and not the Republicans who I think are exploiting very, you know, Exploit, using disinformation or conspiracy theories to garner support from them, right? We should be mad at Tucker Carlson, not the people who necessarily believe Tucker Carlson, right? At least in the same measures. Um, I think there was another one over there. I was gonna kinda go around the room like this. Um, hello, uh, two questions that caused me an equal amount of anger and frustration. Um, one, what do we do with James Harden? <laughs> and two, we've known the Roe ruling was coming in like very specific details for months at this point. And it seems like the Democrats are like very flat footed and it was like, oh shucks, this is really bad. Here's a fundraising email. And like, why is there not a more organized layout? Why is there not like votes of like, okay, all these Republicans, you know, say X, Y, Z thing, like we're gonna have a vote on codifying 15 weeks. We're gonna have a vote on contraception. We're gonna have a vote on all these things that are very broadly popular and would be uncomfortable votes for Republicans. What's your name? Oh, Tony. I will, I'll leave the James Harden part for the end because it feels weird to start with that in the context of uh, Roe v. Wade. Uh, but it also causes me, if not equal amounts of frustration and anger, or significant amounts of frustration and anger. Um, I think the, I was very frustrated myself by the number of Democrats saying, send me $6 because of these six judges. I thought that was tone deaf and dumb. Look, I'm very simple, I've worked on campaigns. My salary has depend, my ability to eat has depended on the success of those emails in the past. So, and it, this has been a tough fundraising environment for a lot of Democrats. So. The typical theory is 
when there's a lot of anger and engagement, that that is a time when people will contribute to campaigns because they're looking for a thing to do. I think tonally, some people really miss the boat on that. Um, that's not a that's not a party. Like the party didn't all get together and decide to be tonally off. It's just like a bunch of individual candidates, email directors, like trying to meet their fundraising quota. In terms of response, like the the truth is, there's very little they can do at the national level, right? There is Nancy Pelosi rolled out a plan, that, like as I was getting in the car to come here, about like what the legislative response in the House is. I think it's going to include some of the things you suggested. Merrick Garland very clearly made a very important statement saying that you could not uh, pass state laws that would ban the use of um, abortion medication. That was very, that's critically important, right? So there were some things in place, but there is, you know, the White House staff and policy experts, all of whom, uh, most of whom I have worked with in the past, were working on this, and there's just very limited tools to do it. Um, but like, I'm not gonna defend, the party can always do better and more aggressively about how we get our message out for sure. Um, but I think there was probably more, I think the anger and the emails, the anger and shock of the moment combined with your opening up your computer and getting a gazillion emails, because everyone only thinks about their campaign, they don't think about that most of us are signed up for like 100 people asking for the same damn thing at the same damn time. Um, like that definitely could have been better. James Harden, I think he's hopefully going to opt in, and then you got to do a short-term contract, and we're just going to hope for the best. <laughs> All right, uh, right here. We'll get you a mic. Um, and it's work that I love and I really care about, but also working on campaigns can sometimes be soul-sucking, physically and mentally exhausting. So I'm wondering if you have any advice for a career in progressive politics without losing hope or getting burnt out. Um, I think it is good to think about your career in progressive politics as a marathon, not a sprint. Do some campaigns, take some time off, you know, work at a, a like a, Organize, you know, a think tank, a nonprofit, a political action committee, you know, work for an actual state senator, state house member, like on the government side. Like I, for, you know, I spent a lot of time in democratic politics before Barack Obama won, so I did a lot of losing. And so there was a lot of like work on campaign, like destroy my soul, go work on Capitol Hill for a couple of years and kind of like build back, you know, sort of forget the trauma of the losing campaign and then go back and do it again. So I think like you don't have to work on campaigns every single day until all of our problems are solved. You can go back and forth and make your own decisions about how you avoid burnout. Because uh, the, worst, the worst thing that can happen is people work on like four campaigns in a row, lose four in a row, and then quit and go to law school, right? And then go become a corporate attorney. Um, you know, it's like James Carville lost like his first like 20 campaigns or something and fortunately stuck around. And so you know, just modulate yourself. You don't have to solve all of the world's problems in like five years. <laughs> all right, um, here on the end. Hi, Lauren Christella. Um, I'm with the League of Women Voters and a nonpartisan group, Committee of 70 here. And I think something, the, the good government talking points are lacking. And I think you can probably broadly uh, critique Democrats for a lack of message discipline. And I think that goes to the other person's comment about the, the lack of a plan. It's yeah. just that no one is repeating the plan. I don't think we need the echo chamber. But like, who is in charge of message discipline and how do you enforce it? I have some bad news for you. <laughs> no one. And there's no one in charge on the right. Like, this is the, I think, Democrats tend, like, I'm not, like in, like, in my book, I write about, like, I have this whole chapter about how the problem is not the message, it's the megaphone, which has been taken by many people to mean me endorsing everything that every Democrat has ever said is perfect, and that's not the case I'm making. But just think of it this way, right? On any given minute of the day, on the right, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert, Paul Gosar, Mo Brooks, Matt Gates are saying, 
incredibly insane things, right? Like you can't say the right is like message discipline when two members of their caucus in good standing attend a white supremacist rally and then refuse to apologize for it. But what they have is they have an apparatus that is just flooding the zone with messaging so it drowns out some of that stuff and shifts the focus back to us. Like, we have no Marjorie Taylor Greens, we have no Paul Gosars, we, that, like, the, that somehow, that's the focus still becomes on, like, Democrats in disarray, and Democrats are not messaged. Now, what I think the fair critique is, is that we theoretically have the biggest weapon in electoral politics, which is we have the presidency which is not the bully pulpit it, what it has historically been, or people think it is. This is not an episode of the West Wing. But it is, you know, obviously the President of the United States has an ability to grab the nation's attention with more frequency than anyone else in the party, right? And I think that, and I think we've seen some shifts in a very positive way in recent weeks, but that's something that, you know, that's ultimately on the White House to be the loudest voice to sort of set up the bat signal about what it is everyone should be saying. And then not everyone's going to follow that script for sure. And some people are going to have uh, different views or new or different twists on how you do it. But there is a little bit of a vacuum there that is being filled both by some voices in our party, which are, which is, can be good. And some, and a lot of voices in their party, which um, is sort of spreading that problem. And so there is, no one isn't, there is no like secret war room where like all the smart people have a whiteboard and they're figuring out. I, I wish I could tell you there was. There never has been in my life in politics. There's not one on the other side. But I think you ultimately, and I think you're going to see a lot more of this in my, is my understanding from President Biden in coming weeks is just more aggressively trying to grab the nation by the lapels and tell them what's going on. All right, right here. Hi, I'm Michelle. I work in design and advertising, and it's, it just blows my mind that so many candidates and so many social um, websites don't take advantage of talking points. And so, for example, like the hearings, there's so many great points, like just a few words, and make it visual and put it on your social. Like I looked at Josh Shapiro's um, um, Instagram the other day. It's just all pictures of him. Like, what does that do? So I guess my question is, is there a reason why they're not doing this? <laughs> like, it really, it really just blows my mind. Like, it seems like they probably have a reason why they're not. Because I know they have people working on their campaigns, and they're not hiring the people to do that? I don't know. They're, once again, I find myself defending <laughs> the Democratic Party. Um, like it, it, like I think I have not spent as much time on Josh Shapiro's Instagram page as perhaps others have, um, but I do spend a lot of time on John Fetterman's Instagram page, and his is the example I think a lot of Democrats should follow, which is, you know, just being a understanding how the world has changed. That Instagram as a political messaging tool is not just pictures of you and your dog, or just like quick videos, or even like poorly choreographed reels. You know, it's, an, it's, it's just yet one more visual medium to put your message out, and that can be in the form of a meme, it can be in the form of a graphic. And there, like, in most cases, in most campaigns, there is a younger set of underpaid social, digital, and communications people pushing a boulder up a hill trying to get the candidate and the candidate's advisors, who are generally of the same generation, to think more creatively and be more risk averse. The, the biggest problem is risk aversion um, in, in political campaigns. And I have a theory that politicians, like understanding of how to communicate is frozen in amber the minute they reach national politics. <laughs> and so just like if you were in politics before the internet, like you're never gonna like be a real super savvy digital person and think about it, and so there is like, it is the kind, like I talk to, because I write about this stuff sometimes, like I, sometimes I feel like I'm like a middle person in between, because I'm not young anymore, between like the younger people and the older people, who, and I'm one of the older people, but that's what it, like I promise you in Josh Spears' campaign, there are a bunch of like super savvy people who are like having a lot of ideas get knocked down, and hopefully uh, 
hopefully Josh Shapiro, and I have no reason to suspect he won't do this, will run a campaign that is aggressive and not just like we're up by four. If we just nothing, don't if we don't rock the boat, we'll still be up by four. And so I think like I don't know about his specific case, but I think there is you have sort of like an older fuddy-duddy way of thinking about things that sometimes pushes out the good ideas. So are you in favor of the Cory Booker video like he put out this past the, week, I The think? running one? Yes. No, I'm not. I Look, I love Cory Booker. He is a great human being. That was like the... Do you guys see that? Do you know what I'm talking about? This is the 445 running one. Is that what you're talking about? With, about the agriculture? Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, no. Running. There was running and hitting and The one tackling, I saw I was Cory Booker saying, every morning at 4.45 a.m., I want to hit my, oh, turn my oh, alarm off. Oh, when he's off. in his neighborhood. No, no, this is, okay. this is him um, and John Tester, I think. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. This is good. I like this. You liked that one. The okay. fact that you're Here. asking me about a Cory Booker video is like it's a sign of success, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like you want people to talk about it. to go with the question. I... Yeah. So you were in favor of that? Yeah, that, yeah, I thought it was good. The other one where he, it's like a motivational thing about how you have to, I mean, you should just watch it, but it was a little much for me. It was kind of like the equivalent of that poster of the kitten hanging on the tree that says like, hang in there. It was like a, it was a it was very, real inspirational poster, 1980 Spencer's Gifts inspirational poster vibes that I was not into, but, but the agriculture video is cool. All right. Uh, do me a favor. If you have a question, just stand up for a minute, because I, I think we have a time to get to everybody, so I just want to make sure that I know where everyone is. Okay. All right. We got one, one on this side, two on this side. Oh, right over here. I'm Bridget. Who will run on the Democratic ticket for president, and who should? Uh. Well, Joe Biden has said he's running. I have no reason to expect he will not. He is also currently the only person walking the planet who has defeated Donald Trump. So that seems like a uh, good quality. And I, th like, I've gotten this question everywhere I've gone, every interview I've done, and here is my take. In like four months, we have an extreme nationalist party trying to seize the reins of power in this country, and we're like, let's stop them and then we can have a debate about whether Joe Biden is really gonna run, should run, should someone else run. Like we can figure, let's get past the midterms for that. I think if there's any chance that Joe Biden is gonna revisit his decision to run, and I have no expectation that he will revisit it, but he would have to do that, in my opinion, very, very quickly after the midterms so that there would be ample time for there to be a process to figure out who the next person is. So short answer is, I don't know the answer, but you have a follow up. Yes. Well, I she may, I promise you that Michelle Obama would definitely win, and I promise you she's definitely not running. Well, yeah. <laughs> there are definitely people out there who can run. I spent a lot of time in. Yes, there were people. With, a Democrat can definitely beat a Republican. There are lots of people out there. I have some thoughts on who those people will be. I'm not going to share them right now, but we should get together after the midterms if Joe Biden decides not to run, and I will make my views on this very known. Okay. All right, let's take the other one down on this side. Hi, my name is Shannon, and I just was wondering what your thoughts are. After um, the road decision came out, a lot of my friends and I were talking, and they like me, had the frustration with a lot of the uh, fundraising messaging and, you know, just like, bro, read a room. But a lot of them were just, you know, this is kind of like why we bother voting and everything. And I had to kind of, re you know, this is part of their plan. You know, this is, they want us to get frustrated and not show up. And that's how we got Trump. Besides that message, like, what, what else can we be doing to, you know, kind of, not get disheartened and kind of fall back into that trap. I have spent a lot of time over the last, whatever it is, 72 hours talking to a lot of very politically engaged people in my life about this very question, right? Like, it just feels like you want to give up. You told us to vote, we voted, and they still overturn Rome. And I think I very much agree that the, just telling people to ju just vote in ending the sentence there is not sufficient. And I thought, uh, AOC had a very good thread on this, which is 
we absolutely have to vote. We have to stay engaged. You're exactly right. The whole point of this is to make us tune out out of cynicism so that they can make decisions about everything in our lives. And, but if we want people to vote, we have to give them a plan of how we solve this problem. And I think in her thread, I would encourage everyone to read her thread. It's very specific about what that plan could look like. I think it begins with getting every single Democrat who's running for Senate to be clear about what they would do for the filibuster if they win and that they would vote to codify Roe. We can start there. I think that, I think that Democrats should be more aggressive, even if we can't implement these things right now, more aggressive in advocating for a court reform agenda that can include everything from expansion to term limits to, oh, I don't know, some sort of conflict of interest pledge, which is your wife cannot organize the insurrection you rule on just as a, <laughs> as a foundation for where we start. Um, to, because the court is incredibly depressing because the, we could, we're going to be stuck with an absent reform. We're going to be stuck with a court like this probably for a very long time. And so I think we need a, a speci- we need to come to people with a specific plan with realistic benchmarks of success that we're not going to solve all these problems today, but here is the path of how we get there and it begins right here. All right, let's move over to the side. Were you question? Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Laura. Um, I'm from Florida, so I'm going to take a second to try to hijack this for a sec for Florida. Plug for Pod Save America to visit Florida on your tour, by the way. Um, I promise we have Democrats there. Um, So as you mentioned in your book, Florida has been um, a turning point in a lot of elections recently, um, dating back to 2000, but even earlier. And, you know, in most recent elections, it seems like we've sort of been caught flat-footed with the Democratic turnout and uh, which way that they've voted, particularly in South Florida. I would love your take on sort of where we missed the boat in recent elections and how Democrats can um, restructure their messaging to bring back voters who, who turned um, to Republicans in recent years and also to bring back um, or bring more Democrats to the Democratic Party this coming November and also in 2024. So Barack Obama won Florida in 2008 and 2012. Narrowly, but he won. And he won in part by sort of a you know big Democratic turnout, registering a lot of voters. Florida has the largest chunk of unregistered black and brown voters in the country by far. And we registered a bunch of them in 2008, 2012 uh, by do winning in or do, performing much better in rural Florida than Democrats had done previously and Democrats did subsequently. And then, out, and then actually, historically, the Cuban-American population in Florida has voted very Republican. The one exception for that is Barack Obama's two election in 2012. Barack Obama actually won the Cuban precincts in Miami uh, and driven by support from young Cuban-Americans. That reversed itself, all those trends reversed itself dramatically, first in 16 and then in 20. And one way in which that happened is the right began in 16 and uh, aggressively in 20, from 16, and then particularly from 16 to 20, is, at, is branding Democrats as supportive of socialists like Hugo Chavez. And there was a, it was the one really smart thing the Trump campaign did very early, is there were constant array constant run of Facebook ads, um, you know, sort of branding Democrats. You know, a lot of it was misinformation. There was stories that went around, particularly on YouTube, about uh, Maduro and others endorsing Biden's re-election. And then they also out-organized us amongst various uh, communities. In fact, the, after the hurricane in Puerto Rico, the Koch brothers funded an organization that basically greeted Puerto Ricans who moved to Florida, like when they arrived with like literature and information uh, and began organizing them because, because nothing makes sense in America. If you are a Puerto Rican who lives in Puerto Rico, you can't vote in a presidential election, but if you move to Florida, you can vote the day you arrive because you're an American citizen. And so we were out organized there. In Florida is, the question is going to matter for Florida is getting harder for Democrats in some ways because of the same trends we've had nationally about we've lost some ground with Latino voters. 
but also there are a lot of, in most states, when people move into the state, it's been helping Democrats, like people moving to Texas, North Carolina, Georgia. Florida is the opposite, right? People's, you know, Republicans are moving from, you know, retiring in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, ever elsewhere, and moving to Florida. Um, but it's certainly, I mean, it's been very close in these elections, it, other, with the exception of 2020. It is winnable, but it's going to take a huge investment in resources. And we need some leadership in Florida, right? That is the problem. The Democrats have not had the governorship in Fl of Florida this century, right? And so when you don't have, like, you're just, the party is atrophied, it, and we're sort of running on the system where it's like, Every couple of years, a presidential campaign will come in four months before the election and try to win it, and that's just not a sufficient way to do it. And it's like if Andrew Gillum, which obviously that's a little more complicated right now, but if the Democrats had won, if a Democrat had won the governorship in 2018, which was our best opportunity to do so in about 25 years, it, that would have given us an opportunity to build up some infrastructure there, but it's gonna take some real investment. All right, I think we got a couple more over here we should be able to get through. Hi, Hillary, also a friend of the pod. Oh, thank you. Um, my question is this. So I have a 21-year-old babysitter and a 67-year-old father, and both of them are Democrats, and both of them um, seem very jaded with everything now. So like on my dad's side, he thinks the progressive messaging is like too intense and we've had arguments about how defund the police isn't like eradicate the police, it's just like a bad marketing campaign and I've, I'm, I've had this same conversation over and over with a bunch of other people his age, it's the baby boomers, which I know John Lovett loves. Um, and then with my babysitter, she's 21 and just feels like what's the point? Like, what's the point of participating? And what is your, how do, you know, I'm 39, how do I have these conversations with liberal people who want to live in a democracy? Like, how do I have these conversations with them to pump them up about, like, where we are right now? It's, it's heavy and it's a lot and it's hard to keep people hopeful. So I think there are, two steps to this in two different paths. So the first step is listen, right? Because people have reasons why they are disengaging. It's important to understand what they are. They may be born of incorrect information or, uh, or conspiracy theory or whatever else, but we should understand what it is so we can address it. And then I think there are two arguments that you can make with people in your life about why this matters. I think the first one is everywhere I go, people are like, you know, it's not the people who are here necessarily in the room, it's the people who are like talking to the people they volunteered with in 2020 or, in, you know, knocked doors with or swing left 2018 and it's like they're disengaged and they, nothing's gotten done and they're frustrated and I think we have to make a more bullish case for what has gotten done, right? And so, I mean, like just we can think about, here's some examples of that, which is with the narrowest mar majorities in history, Joe Biden came into office and passed one of the most progressive pieces of economic legislation in history, one that had the child poverty rate for a time being in this country, that put, get, put money in people's pockets, rescued the economy, put us on a path, made 2021 the year of strongest private sector job growth in American history. Oh, and by the way, he also made it so that every single American who wanted a vaccine could get one. And the fact that we are in this room right now having this conversation is because Joe Biden is president, Donald Trump is not. He, Joe Biden has passed a huge infrastructure bill, and he didn't just pass it, he passed it with 19 Republicans, including Mitch McConnell, that will uh, create good, good jobs in this country, that will grow the economy, that will invest in uh, climate change and climate resilience. He has, um, Put in play, he has put in place some of the smartest people and most competent people in all of government who are every day using every tool the federal government has to undo the damage that Republicans did so that we have clean air, clean water, and a safer planet. He has also put the first black woman on the Supreme Court because if he had lost that election, that decision would, be, would have been uh, much worse than this one. He, Joe Biden has also confirmed more 
federal judges at this point in his history, at this point of his presidency, than Joe Biden, sorry, than Barack Obama and Donald Trump combined. And so, like, there is a, and he is also happens to be the most pro-union president since Roosevelt. And so all of that is a big deal, and it's making a difference in people's lives. Is it everything? Absolutely not. But I think we have to stop buying into the narrative that because we have not yet gotten Build Back Better done, that Joe Biden has done nothing. And that just isn't always an easy conversation because I think Democratic leaders have let people's expectations get out of whack. And then I think there's a very strong case that these hearings can make, and I think Doug Mastrano's presence on the ballot is making it here in Pennsylvania, that this is a, a, the fight against Trump and MAGA extremism is not over. And I won't, I know we gotta get to these last questions here, but sort of as I talked about earlier, about the, the danger of this radical extreme minority who is trying to seize power by any means necessary to ensure that the government makes decisions about your health care, who you marry, who you can love, what books you can read, what teachers can teach, who you can have sex with, all of those things are what the right wing wants to do and we gotta fight back against that. All right, who we got left over here? Hi, Dan. I'm Ariel, also a fan of the pod. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, one of my, obviously a lot of people in Congress, Democrats, Republicans, are very old. Um, and there seems to be sort of a divide in kind of how, you know, some of the younger folks talk about the danger of the moment, right? You know, you have AOC on Instagram and um, talking about sort of the danger of the Republican Party where some of the older members seem to sort of harken back to a time of like, you know, bipartisanship compromise. Do you think like some of the older Democrats are starting to, are like, are realizing, or not realizing, I guess, but like kind of acknowledging that we are, you know, living in really dangerous times? I'm kind of taking this question from like a recent Jamel Bowie column where he talks about, you know, older Dem Democrats are not really being the moment right now and like the urgency. I think that the, there is the, I think in their actions, I think the older Democrats have done more than I think they get credit for. Like the House under the leadership of, an, an entire leadership over the age of 70 passed the, one of their first acts both in 2000 and 19 when they came in, and then in 2021 was to pass the For the People Act, a, a truly historic, revolutionary piece of political reform that is designed to take on the exact threat of a minority trying to exploit loopholes in our political system and gain power, so they did do that. I think rhetorically, a lot of people in the party have struggled to articulate the urgency that a lot of us feel about this moment we're in. And I, it's not entirely generational, right? It, because Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders articulate it quite well, and there are some younger Democrats, uh, I can think of a certain centrist congressman over in New Jersey, who articulate it, uh, who are younger and articulate it quite poorly. And so the, I think that there, there needs to be a better effort from the party to connect, and I think this is one of the challenges that President Biden has had with younger voters, is to connect with that urgency that people feel. Because if you think the country is going off a cliff and you're 25, you're gonna be much more worried about that than if you're 75, right? And so I think speaking to that urgency in a more evocative, plain spoken, authentic way, I think would go a long way to square the circle between what have been actions that were impossible to imagine five years ago from the from 99% of Democrats, 100% of Democrats not named Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, to with the words they say sometimes. Um, and people get Congress brain too, where it's like you have to, you see these people at the gym, you have lunch with them, and it's hard to like square the guy who nicely wiped down the treadmill in the house gym with the same guy who escorted the insurrectionists into your office building. Um, but there, I think, I think you hit on a very important thing that is necessary to actually mobilize the pro-democracy majority in this country is to, under, is to speak to the urgency with power. Thank you. Thanks so much for your talk uh, and your book and all your work before that. My name is Rajan Parekh. And since last Tuesday, when I attended a training at the Fitler Club, I've been a volunteer with 
uh, CTC for Progress that's changing the, uh, the conversation for progress. And it's a nonpartisan group, but since Trump is not on the ballot this year, our script when we knock on doors, and I spent a good part of Sunday in Northeast Philly deep canvassing, knocking on doors, we say, hi, my name is Rajan. Uh, I'm with a group going through your neighborhood talking with voters, and we are trying to prevent Trump loyalists from taking over the country, which right away tells you which way we want people to vote. And whether you're talking with your 21-year-old babysitter or 67-year-old dad, our script basically goes and focuses, rather, your list was amazing, all the bullet points you listed of everything Biden has done in the Democrats, but I think even everyone in this room, by the time you got to number five or seven, unless it was something they really cared about, your eyes start glazing over, because it gets too technical. So changing the conversation for progress focuses on what you love. And you, the script is basically, you know, we have this election coming up, it's really important, it's not presidential, it's governor and senate. And I, I don't just vote because of politics, I vote for the people I love. And then you tell a story about someone you love and why you're voting for them. And knocking, like, it seems really goofy the first time I was at the training on Tuesday, we did another training on Thursday, and then knocking on doors, but it was amazing. Knocking on 60 doors got, you know, 35 people didn't answer or weren't home, 25 people answered and engaged. I had conversations, and, and most of them were already registered, already totally motivated to vote, already really angry with Trump, Roe v. Wade, uh, taking out the New York gun laws, the upcoming EPA decision, the, the religious decision in Maine to fund religious schools, the decision today to allow a coach to pray with his students and, and change the facts. But with those who were like on the fence or, oh, is it important? By the end of a 10 minute conversation, if they weren't registered, we register them. If they didn't have mail-in ballots, we got that form taken care of. And they committed and most of them gave us their phone numbers so we can follow up. So, I think democracy is, saving democracy is too important to leave up to those goofy, lovable Democrats, because a lot of them are great, a lot of them are nice, a lot of them are totally out of touch, and as you, you just mentioned, they don't get the urgency. Um, I've, I've never really canvassed before, and you know, I came to this training, I'd signed up for this, uh, your talk, and through that I signed up for Philadelphia Citizens, and through that I heard about this training. Uh, so when I signed up for your talk, I was just like, eh, and, and since then, I've, I've, I've already committed in the last week 10 hours to deep canvassing. That's and awesome. I think, <laughs> I, I, I think that's, that's what... Nancy Pelosi has had a, a wonderful career with lots of ups and downs. I'm, I'm never going to say anything negative about her, because she's done a lot of great things. But is she still the right person to be there? Is Chuck Schumer still the right person to be there? Is Joe Biden? They're the ones we have. And as uh, a sec certain Secretary of Defense once said, you go to war with what you have. But that doesn't mean you leave it up to them. Because uh, right. we need to, so sorry, it was a kind of a long comment, but I, I wasn't really gonna ask anything, but just, it's sort of directly related to. Uh, yeah, I think, it's, I think that's great advice, sounds like a great organization, and thank you for the work you're doing, it's really good. Did we get to everyone? I think we did, and you know what, we are right on time. Wow, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> Well, Dan, thank you so much for spending the time to, to talk with us. And thank you to all of you for being here and for, and for your great questions. And on a personal note, I cover politics and I love hearing from voters and what motivates you and what interests you and what questions you have. So I was really interested to hear what questions you have and what, were you, what you were interested in this year. So um, I really enjoyed that as well. Well, thank you so much. It was great to see everyone in person. Amazing. <laughs>